Welcome back, Max Wardell, OverheadAthletics.com. We're going to talk about summation of speed today, the kinetic chain, because I see so many individuals putting out, unfortunately, nonsense regarding how to train and how to improve pitching. And I felt compelled to make the video on summation of speed, really from the theoretical perspective, but as well from the practical perspective, because we need to understand how energy moves through the kinetic chain if we're going to put together some sort of exercise regimen or some sort of throwing interventions. And a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing out there is bullshit. So looking at summation of speed. Summation of speed is a physics principle that basically refers to how one moves through a movement such as the throw and creates the highest possible velocity. And that's what we're looking at here is velocity, ball velocity. When we're talking about the throw, um, and when we're talking about other movements, summation of speed is the same kind of principle that we'd use if we're talking about maximizing racket speed or club head speed in golf. First, let's talk about this. Human movement is complex. We've talked about that. It's complex, meaning it's largely unpredictable largely unpredictable. We can have an idea of what the outcome is going to be, but we can't predict the exact outcome. There's no mathematical formula that can predict the outcome if I have somebody do 10 repetitions because that individual is going to do something differently than this individual and they're going to have different physiological and neurological things that are occurring. Therefore, the results are going to be different. So they're largely not predictable, which means there's no formula. For something to have a formula, it has to be predictable because a formula is the system in which you put in exact inputs and get an exact output. There's no such thing when it comes to human movement. So there is no formula to throw harder. Instead, what we're doing is creating a pathway. We don't have a road map that tells us exactly where to turn. Instead, we have a historical map that says, we think the mountains are here. We think the rivers are here. We think the valleys are here. Now you need to get over to here. And we've kind of laid out a few landmarks where we think things are and, and where we think maybe the best pathway, but you're going to have to figure out a pathway. You're going to have to go ahead and be Lewis and Clark right now and move through this. So that's really what we're trying to do is say we're going to take you from where you're at here and we're going to take you to this land over here or this gold, um, gold mine over there, this mountain, and we need to create a pathway to do that. If we're going to create this pathway, we need to understand that movement is complex. There's a lot of things at play. Motor control is complex, not predictable. We also have physics that we have to consider, anatomical considerations, and a bunch of other things we've talked about in other videos. So if we're going to do that, we need to think about movement from the physics standpoint and the motor control standpoint. We need to understand how energy is transferred through the kinetic chain and how speed is summated. So what we've done here is we've put together the kinetic chain on the right. We'll say this is the thigh or upper leg, the pelvis, trunk, arm, forearm, hand. This is the amount of force. It, this is time. So time goes, this is time for both of these two graphs. So from the force perspective, and this is what a lot of people are looking at, and I don't think that they're considering everything if you're only thinking about the force. So people would say, all right. As you move through the kinetic chain, force at that specific area increases because we're transferring kinetic energy to a smaller, to a smaller uh, segment. Therefore, the force per unit area is increased. The thigh, the pelvis, the hip, and we're, we're maybe generating some early on and then we're kind of transferring it through the kinetic chain as we go. What we should be looking at is the summation of speed and how speed is summated. So what we've done is we've drawn the pelvis rotation. So this is all transverse uh, rotation of the pelvis, transverse rotation of the trunk, which corresponds to elbow extension later in the throw. So around that axis rotating in this fashion or on a slight angle based on the pitcher. The pelvis is going to rotate anywhere that literature will tell you different numbers. We can argue about the numbers, but we all know that it summates and gets more as you go. So let's say 900 degrees per second. As some research would say, the pelvis is rotating at 900 degrees per second towards the target. Then the trunk rotates at 1300 degrees per second towards the target, and the elbow extends at 2300 or 2100 degrees per second out and around on that same arc. So if we think about those things, how does speed summate? Well, in order for speed to summate, 
we need to ensure that the subsequent or the next segment begins its rotation when the previous segment reaches its peak velocity. Therefore, we are summating or we're taking the speed from the previous segment and moving into the next one. So when the pelvis reaches its peak angular velocity or peak rotational velocity, 900 degrees per second, the trunk begins to rotate. As it accelerates and then reaches its peak, the elbow begins to extend out and around. So that's how the, the body will move. And if one of these issues of timing is off, let's say the elbow begins to extend too early or too late, we don't maximize the contribution of the previous segments to its rotational velocity. You can see that if the elbow began to extend here, we're not gonna maximize it. If the elbow begins to extend here, once again, we're not gonna maximize the speed of the previous segment, therefore we're gonna lose out on speed. So it's more so about timing of when the segments begin to accelerate that's the most important for determining the final velocity of the dis most distal component, which is where the ball is. So we need to think about when the segments begin the rotation, as opposed to this just pure, what the, how fast does the pelvis rotate? That's great, but first let's talk about, okay, if the trunk timing is off, the kinematics are off, the timing's off, we're gonna have really, really big problems. We're never gonna transfer the amount of energy that we need to the most distal extremities, the forearm, the hand, where they, they need to move the fastest. When we think about speed, when we think about velocity, we need to think about transfer of kinetic energy. Everybody talks about creation of kinetic energy, and that's my problem. They have, the funny one is, you need to deadlift X amount, you need to reverse lunge a certain amount, you need to do a chin up of a certain amount, as if those had any correlation from um, a motor control perspective to the throw, because we know that strength is specific, and strength in one plane, and in one movement, in one context, does not determine how powerful you're gonna be in another context. You actually have to be specific. Um, that's just a, a simple principle um, that I, I think most of the scientific community understands. Said we've been talking about the the said principle for a while. Specific adaptations for imposed demands. We also think about that from a neurology perspective because we know the nervous system doesn't let us pull up, put our full power into something new. So if you have never bench pressed before, your muscular system may be able to, it has the capacity to bench press 250 pounds, but because you've never bench pressed before, there's a governor on you. You're not going to be able to bench press 250 pounds. It's only, you know, your nervous system is only going to allow you to do 185. In three weeks, you can do 250 pounds, or in seven weeks, you can do 250 pounds. Your muscle tissue didn't get any stronger. Your nervous system just said, oh, this is a safe movement. Therefore, we'll allow the body to allocate more of the muscular tissue to performing it. And add more motor units to the movement. So strength and power are specific. Anyone who tells you it's not doesn't, doesn't realize that very concept. It's very simple to see in beginner weightlifters. So we need to have specific exercises. We need to have exercises that actually train the body to do what it needs to do in the throw. So let's just think about this equation down here, which we're looking at omega, which is angular velocity or rotational velocity. It's equivalent to the square root of kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, times 2 over mass times radius squared. So this is essentially how a large segment, a large segment such as the pelvis, that has a lot of mass to it. There's a lot of mass around the pelvis. Think of all your organs. Think of all the meat and tissue around the pelvis. As that rotates, it's going to transfer energy up to the trunk, which has a little bit less mass. And in doing so, the trunk is going to rotate faster. So elastic energy is stored as the pelvis is rotated in the connective tissue. Then it is elastically recoiled or released into the upper body tissue. The upper body rotates at a higher degrees per second or angular velocity because it has less mass. And then that energy is then transferred distally into elbow extension rotational velocity, which has a significantly lower mass. And therefore we get transfer of kinetic energy from large proximal segments to smaller distal segments. And as they go, the speed increases. It's the, it's the concept of we want to maximize the, 
the kinetic energy created in the beginning, but really we want to transfer as much as possible. The more kinetic energy we lose at each step in the process, the more or the less we'll have at the end product. So we need to make sure we're transferring as much as possible. And how that is done is by transferring kinetic energy from large proximal segments to smaller distal segments that have a lower mass, therefore are going to rotate at a higher angular velocity. That's, that's basically what it is. Now, how can we maximize that speed? We can make sure the timing is right so that the segment that follows can utilize the segment of the preceding or the velocity of the preceding segment. So to make sure the trunk timing in relation to pelvis timing is correct, the elbow timing in relation to trunk timing is correct, and there's basically a gray area or a, an acceptable bandwidth if it's within this range, we're going to transfer energy pretty well. We're going, to, we're going to maximize our speed pretty well. But if we do it way too early or way too late, we're really going to have a problem. And that's basically how energy is transferred through the kinetic chain. So that brings us to the next point, which is, okay, what if we have a weak link in the kinetic chain? Well, if there's a weak link, we're not going to transfer energy through that link very well. Therefore, we need to have a symbiotic relationship of all of the different elements in the chain, but we also have to have enough stability, enough strength, and enough capacity in each segment or each link so that energy can flow through it and move on to the more distal or higher up segments. In order to do that, we need to understand how kinetic energy is also created. We know that the throw specifically is a very rapid movement. It's a very quick movement. And moving a high amount of weight a 400 pound deadlift or a 400 pound squat or any other exercise with a lot of load slowly has very little to do with moving a very little amount of weight, the body weight, rapidly. So if we just looked at and said, okay, when somebody pushes off the mound, they generate two to three times their body weight in terms of ground reaction force. We'd say, all right, well, maybe they need to do two or three times their body weight in weightlifting. And we'd say, wait a, wait a second, right, right there. Because it has to do with the rate of force development. The, the, the slower I move, the less it relates to the throw. So power lifters theoretically should throw harder than everyone because they can produce the most amount of force. But the rate of force development is very dismal compared to our high intensity uh, athletes or our power athletes, our speed athletes, our pitchers. The pitchers can produce a lot of force very fast. The rate of force development is very high. Or our sprinters, the rate of force development is very high. They may not be able to squat 500 pounds, but they can produce a lot of force in a very short instant. Let's go with black being the power, the, the more force. They apply force over a longer period of time. They can get way up here. This is their peak, their peak force, but it takes them all of this time to get there and then we have our top flight athletes our pitchers they may only get to this force not nearly as high but they get there much faster this is going to play it doesn't matter if i can lift 500 pounds if i can produce a lot of force in 0.5 seconds i'm going to do much better than if it takes me two and a half seconds to produce twice as much force. If I can produce force faster, it's gonna play. Therefore, it's not about how much force I can produce, it's more so about how fast I can produce that force. And that's why util moving slow with heavy loads has very little, if anything, to do with moving fast with light loads, which is what throwing is. High most high intensity movement is that. So we're not Olympic lifters, we're not power lifters, we don't need to lift super heavy loads. Instead, we need to be able to Produce as much force as possible in as little time as possible, and then transfer that energy to subsequent segments and do so by utilizing correct timing and understanding that that timing has to do with many, many systems that are at play with one another. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, if you have any adverse reactions, drop them in the comment section. I'll be sure to get to those maybe in a future video, maybe in the comments, but we want to address as many things as possible. So it's not about, once again, lifting heavy loads slowly or doing these very specific things. It's about 
making sure your tiny is what it needs to be, producing as much kinetic energy as possible, which means producing force as fast as possible, and then transferring the energy as efficiently as possible. So when I look at these programs out there, what I've seen is that a lot of them have tried to uh, account for their inadequacy by adding in other components, which is, you know, authentic mechanics, which I don't really know what authentic mechanics means, and I don't I don't think anyone could actually tell me what authentic mechanics mean. Do they mean that they transferred energy as efficiently as possible throughout the kinetic chain? Well, if they did that, what are the other aspects of the formula necessary? I don't know. So this is summation of speed. This is how we create a pathway moving forward. And then we can talk about how we actually alter and improve movement to actually improve each stage of this. And we've done that in a lot of videos, but we'll put together a better framework to move forward. So if you liked the video, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you guys in the next one.